Hello, and welcome to Sunday School with Pastor Josh. I'm wearing a tie today. Well, thanks for joining me today. I'm glad that you've decided to uh, continue in this study of spiritual disciplines as we uh, learn more about God's Word, how to get to know God better, and we're in the second session of this in the Bible Studies for Life study. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Psalm 119. Now, the world inundates us with all kinds of things, all kinds of information, all the time. Our minds are filled with things from this world at every moment of every single day, unless, of course, we set aside time to get away from our cell phones, get away from the billboards, get away from the TV, and spend quiet time with God. So the world always, always inundates us with messages that are contrary to God. And if we allow our lives to be lived out that way, and to never engage God's word to help counter that constant bombardment against us, we will always feel out of control. We will always feel that we are not close to God. And ultimately, we won't even know who God is. Because the only way that we can really know God is to engage with God. Engaging with God requires that we engage in his word. And when everything else is pouring in on us and bombarding us and distracting us from God's word, we are drawn away from him. I want you to imagine this with me, that you're married, you have a beautiful wife or a beautiful husband, handsome husband. You know, he could be beautiful too. I have no idea how you see your husband. But imagine that you never spend time with them, but you spend time with other beautiful women and handsome men all the time. Are you going to be faithful to your spouse if that's the way that you live out your marriage? I would imagine probably not. In fact, your spouse would probably be pretty upset about that. But that's kind of the picture that we get when we're bombarded by the news from the world and all of the kinds of trash that the world pours into us, whether it's a news or fake news or it's uh, um, advertisements or um, sex or drugs or alcohol or basically anything uh, takes up time from us and takes up mental space from us engaging with God's word. And so we have to be careful to guard our time with God's word every single day. And I encourage you to do that because and as you're engaging with God's word, your mind really starts to be shaped by his word. His word is more powerful than any two-edged sword. His word is powerful enough to change the hearts and the minds of people who are in rebellion to him. And it, counteract, and it counteracts the influence that the world has upon us. We are to be renewed by the restoring of our mind. And so let's look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is more than double the length of any other psalm. It's an acrostic, so every uh, beginning section begins with the same letter, uh, with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet in the Hebrew alphabetical order. And so it's very long, so, but we're only going to be looking at a few verses today. Psalm 119 verses 17 through 18 are where we're going to start. Dear generous, Deal generously with your servants so that I might live. And then I will keep your word. Open my eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instructions. In this particular uh, passage, we see that this is a type of prayer that the psalmist uh, is, is presenting to God. He's asking God specifically to deal generously with him, meaning basically deal well with me, reward me for my pursuit of, of you. The psalmist's prayer suggests that he expected God to relate to him, not in judgment, but in goodness and mercy. Now, why would he do that? Well, because the psalmist has taken time to be able to focus on God, to love God, to engage with God, to ensure that his life remains in step with God every step of the way. And so as he's asking God to deal de deal. Uh, generously with him. He's saying, then I will keep your word. Why will I keep your word? Because you're faithful to your word. If there's one thing that we can be certain of, it's that God is 100% faithful to his word. His word will always be true 
and it will live throughout all of eternity. God will always be faithful to it. And we can expect that as we engage with God and as we engage his word, that we will be able to experience the graciousness and the mercy of God despite our circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to be rich. It doesn't mean that generosity is going to become like uh, like money or any kind of thing like that. But we're talking about spiritual generosity. Deal generously with me. Fill me up with your spirit. Make my desire yours. But the only way that the psalmist is going to be able to experience that is to keep his word. And he says that. Deal, deal generously with your servant so that I might live. His very being, his very essence is to know God's word, is to be close to God, is to grow in God, is to love God. And he will live through that. Now we think about life as being physical life. Like if this life ends, that's it, we're done. And then we go to heaven. But the psalmist is saying, your word is life. Jesus says that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that is spoken from the mouth of God. And so when we're engaging with his word, his word is life. Anything apart from God, anything apart from God's word leads to death. It is death, but God's word alone is life. And so he's asking God, deal generously with me. Prove yourself faithful to your word that I might live and I will keep your word. I will stay in step with your word. That is his prayer. That is his fervent prayer. Now, when was the last time that you prayed fervently that God would do something radical in your life, that he would fill you up, that he would uh, give you a great desire to dig into his word, to know him more, to grow in him, that you may know him better and so that you may live. That should be the desire of every Christian's heart, to want to dig into his word so deeply that we find that our very life depends upon it. And he says, open my eyes so that I may contemplate the wondrous things from your instruction. I just talked about the fact that we should cultivate a desire in our hearts. Ask God to cultivate a desire in our hearts to fill us with his word. I mean, contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. We're not just talking about, hang on, I got 15 minutes to sit down with God's day to do my Bible reading and then go on with the rest of my day. We're talking about the fact that he spent time actively seeking God's word and he was asking God, reveal to me the revelation that is in the written, the written word of God. Help me to see you in it. Help me to contemplate who you are. Open my eyes that I may see. Not that I can just get through this because it's a chore that I have to do, but the, the psalmist has in mind that God is wonderful. That his ways, his heights, and his depths are unsearchable by man. We could never reach the fullness of God's height and depth but that they are so wondrous that it beckons us deeper and deeper. And he says, let me contemplate that. Give me the desire of my heart. Listen, if the desire of your heart is not to be engaged in God's word, not to be engaged with God's people, not to be engaged in hearing God's preaching and God's teaching, I would question whether or not you're captivated by Jesus, whether or not you're saved. And why do I say that? Because God builds in us a desire to know him. And if we believe that our very life comes from him, that he breathed the breath of life into us, that his word contains life, that his ways contain uh, lead us to life and away from death, that his ways are better than man's ways, and that his uh, height and his depth are more unfathomable than we can possibly imagine, but the greatness of knowing him is worth every effort we put into it, then, then we know that we have a desire to know God, that we have uh, a personal relationship with him, 
The wondrous things is the revelation of God's character, and that's what we should desire to know. The question is, do we desire to know it, or do we just desire to get by? Heaven's going to be very disappointing to people who've spent five minutes in prayer or five minutes reading their Bible every day, because it's going to be worship every day, exploring the wondrous depths of who God is. God reveals himself. And then the psalmist also wants to know what he expects of, of himself, what, what God expects of him. He says in verses 19 through 22, I am a resident alien on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. I am continually overcome with longing for your judgments. You rebuke the arrogant, the ones under a curse, who wander from your commandments. Take insult and contempt away from me, for I have kept your decrees. I am a resident alien on earth. The reality of this world is that every single person is an alien on this planet because ultimately it belongs to God. Ultimately it belongs to God. So I am a resident alien. I live here, but only as a passer through. As believers, this is not our eternal home. It's not non-unbelievers' eternal home either. Hell will be their eternal home. But this is where we sojourn for a time. And so in this time, we get to know God. You imagine that in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve were in the garden, he created them, him, them to know him personally and intimately. And now while we can't physically walk with God like they did in the garden now because of our own sin, we can seek to know his commands, to know how to live in this world that he created. So many people get off track because they decide that they want to live life another way apart from the way that God has commanded them and they wonder why their life is terrible or why their life gets off track. It's ultimately because God has given us a plan for how to live as aliens on this earth, as sojourners on this earth. And so the psalmist is saying, do not hide your commands from me. Let me know how to live for you. Let me know the, the fullness of who you are and what you expect from me. I resident alien on earth. Do not hide your commands. I desire to know them. And that should be the prayer of our hearts. He says, I am continually overcome with longing for, for your judgments. The psalmist wants to know what God judges as right and righteous and what is wrong and unrighteous, that he may be able to continue to walk in that. And ultimately, what the psalmist is saying is, God, I will follow your word, but you have to tell me what is right and what is wrong. For without you, I can't live in this world. Diligently seeking God's face and his judgments on things will help us live lives that are pleasing to him and also lead lives that are full for us. Jesus didn't come to put a poo-poo party uh, on those who follow him. He said, I came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly because life is not ultimately about your worldly pleasures. Life is about ultimately knowing God and enjoying him forever, the greatest joy. So when we're asking God to, um, to show us his judgments, we're asking for his grace and his favor upon us to show us how to have the most joy in our own lives, to pursue his kingdom. Now, that also means that there are going to be those who are against God. And that's where we're going to turn to next in verse 21. So verse 21 says, You rebuke the arrogant, the ones under a curse, who wandered from your commandments. Take insult and contempt away from me, for I have kept your decrees. Now to rebuke means to punish, to put away, to put out, to censure to reprimand, to reprove. And basically, it means that God is pouring out judgment upon someone or something. A lot of times it's related to uh, the nations and his commands toward them. The Bible uh, repeatedly speaks of God's displeasure with the arrogant. He, re he repeated, the Bible repeatedly speaks of God's displeasure with the arrogant. Now, what we're talking about is when we're talking about the proud, we're talking about the fact that God detests, 
God hates the proud, but what gives grace ultimately to the humble. Everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So what's the difference between pride and self-confidence? Because sometimes those two can become confused. Now, a lot of people will have pride, but pride says, I can do this with or without God. I don't need God to help me. But self-confidence says, I'm confident in my abilities that God has given me, but ultimately I'm reliant upon him for those things. So we all have a little bit of pride, some of us more than others. But the psalmist says that he will rebuke the arrogant. And he desires not to be arrogant. We desire not to be arrogant. Those who are arrogant are cursed by God, are under the punishment. And why are they under the curse? Why are they under punishment? Because they've wandered away from God. But the question is, okay, but if the, the proud are under the punishment, what are the people who, uh, who are not proud? What do they look like? Who are those who are going to be blessed and not under the curse? And the opening verse of Psalm 119 provides an answer. It says, they are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. They are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all of their heart. So the ones under God's curse are not, are those who don't live blamelessly, but who live according to their own Desires. They live apart from God's instructions, but those who live righteously follow his decrees and look to him with all of their hearts. Now, the psalmist goes on here in verse 22. He says, take insult and contempt away from me from I have kept your decrees. Now, people were attacking the psalmist for keeping God's decrees. The reality is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the world is against you. Think about that. So many people in the world, those who are against Christ, those who are part of the kingdom of Satan, are against you. World institutions, everyone who is apart from God, who does not keep his decrees. And the, and the psalmist says, they, they're insulting me. They're reviling me. They're shaming me. They have contempt. They hate me. They not only hate me, they, they are condescending towards me. They are disrespectful towards me. They wish I was not alive. And so when we're following Jesus, we've made a choice to say yes to God and no to the world. And society says, you're an idiot. It says, let's celebrate the things that are wrong and our freedom away from God. And we're saying, but listen, listen, God has a way for us to live where we can be happier. And they say, you're a fool. And they push back and they insult and they throw contempt. But Jesus says this, Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So the reality is we can expect persecution and difficulty in our world. And in our walk with Christ, because Christ experienced it, because the word of God is an affront to humanity. The hope of Christ is an affront to humanity who says, we're not sinful. An affront to humanity that says we can save ourselves. But in reality, we're so far from it. But the proud say, we don't need God. And God hates those who are proud. But he gives grace to those who follow him.